So for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, we're going to uh, change gears a little bit and uh, have a panel discussion about careers and economics here. So uh, my name is Willem van Zandwegen, and I'm going to be moderating the, the panel. Um, I'm an assistant vice president here in the Cleveland Fed's research department, and I'm also uh, the head of the team of research analysts. Uh, that's uh, uh, one of the nice parts of my job. So our, our team of analysts, we have 15, and they play uh, key roles in supporting the work of the department, including su uh, supporting uh, research work uh, from our, uh, by our economists, as well as the policy work done in the department, and also they're uh, making, uh, making sure that our external data products uh, get put out uh, in a timely manner and in a correct way. So, and that's just one of their uh, roles, some of their roles that they're playing. And today I have the privilege to introducing you, of introducing you to three of our uh, uh, RA, our research analysts. Uh, we have Matt Gordon, Chris Healy, and Jason Meyer. Let me briefly introduce them um, before passing the floor. So Matt Gordon holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics with statistical emphasis and a BS in Mathematics with Statistics Emphasis from the University of Utah. His primary research interests are in macroeconomics, in time series econometrics, and monetary policy. Chris holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics and a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics from the State University of New York at Albany. His primary research interests are modern portfolio theory, inflation pressures, and bounded rationality. And Jason has a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Wheaton College in Illinois. And his primary research interests are in econometrics, public economics, and applied microeconomics. So each of these uh, three of our talented RAs, they bring their own perspectives to their roles, uh, their, their daily work. So I know they're going to have interesting insights to share with you based on the work they do day to day, as well as how that work fits into their, their career paths. So I'm going to start out by asking them to introduce uh, yourselves to, to the audience and maybe talk a little bit about your interests, your, your work interest, and also how you see that fit into your uh, longer term paths. So Matt, uh, why don't you kick things off? Hello, hello. Oh, sweet. <clears throat> so I'm Matt Gordon. Uh, as Willem introduced to me, you know, I was from the University of Utah. Um, this is coming up to the end of my first year uh, as an RA here at the Cleveland Fed. I had interned for a year beforehand, though. So this is kind of like two years here at the Fed, but one year as an RA. Um, like Willem said, you know, economic time series, macroeconomics, generally kind of my broad field of interest. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Welcome. So my name's Chris. I went to the State University at Albany. This is my second year in the workforce, but first year as an RA. I previously worked in finance. I made a pivot here, where now I focus on a lot of macroeconomics and banking topics. Hi, everybody. Um, as Willem mentioned, my name is Jason Meyer. I graduated a year ago from Wheaton College in Illinois, and I've been at the bank for about a year now. Um, as Will mentioned, a lot of my research interests are sort of in applied macro microeconomics and as well developed some interest in real estate um, and other topics over the course of my time here. Thanks uh, for introducing yourselves. So, uh, and please, uh, while we're having the discussion, please, of course, uh, continue your lunch, but I'll also invite everyone in the room here and virtually to uh, just uh, r bring out your questions that you have. I'll just uh, kick things off uh, with a question for, for, for the uh, panel members. Uh, maybe a simple question when you go back to perhaps when you were a senior or even a junior, uh, what led you to the decision to apply to, to be an RA specifically at the Fed? And what maybe were some of the considerations you had around that decision? All right, I can go ahead and start this one off. So as Willem mentioned, 
Um, my majors were in mathematics and political science, which is notably not economics. And so I was sort of late uh, to the idea of doing economics research. I had worked with a few professors at my school in research jobs throughout my time in undergrad, and the summer before my senior year had interned at a think tank in Washington, D.C. I thought I was much more interested in this very public policy sort of route, um, and eventually began to realize that if I'm very interested in very empirically rigorous research that has a lot of questions about causality. When I was studying statistics and political science, economics was a very good way to be able to address the questions that I wanted with the rigor that I thought that some of the public policy experiences I had um, hadn't really given me. And so I got to know some of the economics faculty at my school, made a lot of calls over the course of that summer, learned about the opportunity for RA programs, especially at the Fed, um, and started applying from there. I had interest in doing academic research, but wasn't sure entirely that I wanted to commit my life to that. And I also wanted to be able to learn and be exposed to a lot more fields within econ that I didn't get a chance to do in undergrad. Um, so something like an RA role was, was perfect for me sort of getting to you know, brush up on my qualifications, but also explore my interests and develop them further as I was sort of making this pivot from the mathematics side to the econ side. So towards the tail end of my senior year, I already had a job lined up in finance, but I wanted to keep my ideas and options open for where I was going after. So I actually attended an event just like this, hearing RAs talk about their job, and I thought, wow, this is something that really interests me, and it was something I wanted to keep on the table. Um, so after graduating, I stayed in contact with a professor of mine, and I helped him with his research, and it just seemed to be a lot more impactful towards I wanted to do and work on with my life. Um, so I made the transition, and now I'm here. Um, I had, in undergrad, wanted to pursue a PhD in economics, and coming from the University of Utah, which is like a decent R1 school, but our Department of Economics wasn't really well known. We didn't really have, have faculty that were actively publishing. Well, I was afraid my letters were going to be weak, and so I saw the RA position as an opportunity to kind of, you know, not only get some research experience, but also, you know, spend some time developing quantitative skills, developing relationships with people who are publishing in the field and kind of strengthening my profile that, while grateful for the education I got at the University of Utah, you know, kind of helped add like an extra plus one to it, or so I like to hope, um, applying this fall. So we'll see actually how that turns out. <laughs> Are there any questions in the room? Yes, while you're thinking of your questions, I actually wanted to kind of ask the panelists to uh, sort of just describe what a typical day looks like for you uh, here, here to, in your role. I can start us off again. I think we're forming a pattern. Um, so a lot of the day-to-day -day work that the research analysts do at the bank um, involves a lot of programming in statistical software packages, things such as Stata, R, Python, MATLAB. Um, that can, the type of work that we're actually doing varies a lot based on the, the projects, and also all of us work with multiple economists across the bank um, and have additional responsibilities apart from assisting with research. Some of that may be gathering new data and assembling new data sets. Some of it might be visualization and then getting into like early analysis and modeling. Um, a lot of normal days will involve meetings with the economists that you work with to discuss the work that you've done and, and continue to explore what possibilities you have in those projects. Um, and as well, we assist in, in different parts of the policy process. So as the, the Federal Open Market Committee meets every eight weeks, we assist in preparing visualizations, briefing materials, et cetera, for that, which is a, a very cool process to be involved in. Um, there are additional respons responsibilities that the RAs have, um, such as getting to be involved in outreach and recruiting. And something like what we're doing right now is outreach, a nice way to get to assist the goal of the research department in, in cultivating a pipeline of future economists, as I've heard a phrase said a few times. I'll try not to repeat any of the points Jason said. All those things are, I think, true for all of us. But a big part of my day, I feel like, is collaboration, whether it's talking with the RAs or economists, just sharing research ideas with everybody, which is something that I didn't really anticipate going in. There is so much bumping into people and just exchanging ideas and information that helps you develop where you want to go and where you want to bring your ideas. 
I mean, Jason kind of covered quite a bit of ground. Um, good for him. But I, I would say more than that, you know, I'm probably spending day to day, and it does vary because you know we get paid to do things like this, which is pretty cool. But we there there are other opportunities for conferences scattered throughout the year for RAs. I think my one year I've been here, I've probably gone to maybe four conferences while here at the Cleveland Fed, which compared to when I was an undergrad, I had gone to one undergraduate symposium. So like four years, one undergrad, for one, sympo or one symposium, and then one year, four conferences. I think that's a pretty good, you know, good experience to kind of learn. But that, that's not really day to day, although that does happen somewhat frequently. Um, Programming is probably about 50% of my daily work day. And the other half 50% is you know talking to economists, reading pa papers, and kind of broadening and getting, getting a deeper economic understanding that you know in undergrad and intermediate macro micro you weren't really quite getting. I think I would actually one other point um, in the long list of things I said that I didn't cover is we also have a number of uh, seminars that happen within the department. Um, either people visiting uh, from other academic institutions, people presenting their research within the department, and RAs are able to attend those. And it's a, a great way to get a sense of how people receive feedback on ongoing research, how people present it, um, that you've seen all of these sorts of things that are, that are very common within the field and within research. Um, and you get to learn a lot about research that's being done right now and isn't even published yet. And actually, in hindsight, uh, thinking about it, you know, we do publish research ourselves. Like we have what are the economic commentary series in which RAs work together with economists to publish, you know, very short policy briefings. And you know, those oftentimes can work, like you know, morph into like a working paper, which is really nice. Um, not just that, but like inflation. I don't know if you've been on our website where you can see inflation now casting or median PCE, median CPI. The RAs have like, you know, our fingerprints are all over that. Um, there are several RAs here that are responsible for making sure those figures come up every day, making sure every month those are available. And so that's another thing we get, get, get to be involved in, which is really cool because those websites, you know, they're really heavily trafficked and it's like, I am responsible for something that a lot of people are looking at, which is like, you know, almost empowering in, in, in a way. Question in the. I teach undergraduate economics, and so obviously I want students to be econ majors. But I have a sense they would maybe be better off spending more time with the math department and computer science and statistics than hanging out with the econ. I'm talking about the undergraduate level. Can you just address the mix of stuff somebody should expose themselves to to end up in a position like yours? Start. So I'm both an econ and math major, so I kind of got the both best of both fields. I started as an econ major and then just kept on taking math courses that I ended up just majoring in math. Um, I would say, you know, there definitely is an advantage to those math skills. I think one of my more important, and this might be more of my own field of interests, um, upper level uh, probability, upper level statistical inference was really helpful. Now, I don't think that necessarily means you have to be a math major. I think there's still some weight to being an econ major. I would argue probably the biggest high level skill that I've developed um, during my undergrad career was economic intuition. Because you can read a paper, you can look at it and you can read, oh yeah, supply and demand and et cetera, et cetera. But it, it's very difficult, I, I, I would imagine, you know, trying to explain this to like other people who aren't econ majors, um, what it means, you know, and like there's there's an advantage to that econ background in terms of like developing this intuition, because in the end, that intuition forms everything. It forms your coding skills when you have to program an estimator. It program, you know, it it narrows your math skills, because you know, do you really need to know, you know, like some of the real analysis stuff versus like, you know, knowing how to apply that real analysis stuff in terms of an econ framework, you know, in, in re reality, when, when what you're actually doing. So. I would argue, you know, math is important. Do I think you need to be a math major? Probably not. I mean, those skills are helpful, especially in being competitive. But really, if you just want to be well-rounded and kind of have an understanding of what you're actually doing, the e there's still weight to the econ, econ background. So I was an econ major up until day one of my senior year. Um, it was a very last minute change. And it, it happened because I wanted to make my own piece of research. And I started doing like literature reading and trying to see what was going on in the field, and I could not understand the papers at all. Everything was going way over my head, so I realized very quickly, okay, I need some calculus understanding, I need some linear algebra here. 
But I would say the best way for a student to learn those things is to have a reason to learn them. So having an ongoing project that requires you to develop those skills, that's how I learn at my job. I don't just sit down and go, I'm going to learn this today. I have a goal that I want to reach, and to get there, I have to take necessary steps. Um, I don't think I have a ton to add, especially since I'm one of the ones who is not an econ major. Um, I think that there's trade-offs and benefits to each one. So you'll have distinctives and good qualifications if you were a math major, and there's some learning the econ intuition, like what Matt was talking about. Um, and one thing that's nice about something like the RA program, where we're sitting right now, is we have the opportunity to take courses at local universities. So um, in my case, I've taken econ classes since I had plenty of math coursework. Other people have taken things like real analysis or probability theory if they didn't take that in undergrad. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities to emphasize your strengths and then also shore up some of the areas that were not as well prepared in before whatever sort of opportunities you're going on to. It's, it's a great way to professionally develop as well and helps you in the job that you're doing now. I know that the coursework that I've taken, even as an RA, has helped me in my day-to-day -day work here. Was there another question over here? Uh, so this question is for all panelists again. Uh, is there anything that you don't like about your job, or are there anything that you don't like about your job? Data cleaning. <laughs> um, it has to be done, right? But it's not fun doing it. You know, you have to turn on music and just start, you know, cleaning variables, cleaning strings. You know, working on a project now where I have to like look at a bunch of C-span videos to find timestamps. That's not fun, you know, because a lot of time it's boring congressional testimony. Um, but it needs to be done. Um, but that's probably my least favorite part of the job, but if I'm going to be quite frank, I think the pros definitely outweigh the cons. Um, data cleaning is not that bad of a thing, all things considered. Since they're considering I want to do econ, like, it's part of the game. In defense of data cleaning, though, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just feel like I, I don't have at least a least part of the job, but I, I got to just comment on this. I feel like, again, doing the, the boring things even at this job, there's so much opportunity to learn from it, though. I feel like being told, hey, here's some data, go clean it, here's how it should look. I've developed skills from that. That's and I true. feel like it's really helped me grow, even in the short time I've been here. I think one good thing to, to keep in mind when it comes to stuff like data cleaning or other tasks that can be a little bit tedious is it's important to remember the end goal um, and being able to reach that occasionally. The times when I am less happy in the job is when I've forgotten what I'm working towards and the interesting possibilities that will come from all of this data cleaning work that's taking always much longer than I expect it to. Um, it's, it's good to keep that in mind the whole way, uh, to keep your spirits up and motivation and remember that it is something that is very interesting and worth doing. It's part of the job. It's the less glamorous part, but you can't get to the glamorous part without it. It's good to remember that that's coming. There's a question in the back. Yeah, could you all speak to uh, what made you all decide to pursue an, an RA position specifically with the Cleveland Fed as opposed to maybe some of the other Federal Reserve banks? Start us off this time. Mm -hmm. So for me, as someone who's into macro, uh, the Cleveland Fed has their very own Center for Inflation Research, which hosted their own conference here once. It was the first conference I went to. So being at a Federal Reserve Bank with such a strong focus on inflation and macro policy, to me, I felt was very important. But also being here and being an RA and hearing about experiences just across the system, again, as someone who's interested in macro and monetary policy, I feel like the involvement with the monetary policy prep work is something very unique to my position, and I'm genuinely grateful to assist in it. I mean, especially if your research interest is in like applied macro, inflation, time series dynamics, like Cleveland is... You know, you go to like ResPAC, you know, Cleveland's ranked very high in terms of like the Federal Reserve systems. I mean, so if that's your research interest, that's definitely like, like great, you know, one to one there. But even if you're, that's not your interest res or like your research interest, you know, Cleveland's low cost of living. Um, for me personally, I was lucky to have an established relationship with one of the economists here when I started as an intern. Like he was like friends with one of my professors. So that was part of the reasons. But if I had to go back in time, knowing what I know now, even without that relationship, I still think I would come to Cleveland just because of like 
the research is like works very well with what I'm interested in. I think as well as someone who's had different research interests, uh, one of the unique things about Cleveland compared to other RA possessions, especially within the Federal Reserve System, is that you have the opportunity to work directly with multiple different economists, and those can be across different groups. So we have four different groups in the research department. There's banking and finance, macroeconomic forecasting, macroeconomic policy, and then the microeconomics group. And you have the chance to be exposed to multiple fields. Uh, for example, there's, there's one third year RA who came in having done a lot of applied micro research and had a lot of interest and decided to request to be paired mostly with people who were in banking and finance or macro to be able to learn and be exposed to more of those fields to figure out what his interests were before preparing to go to grad school. Um, that's not something that you get in all other kinds of RA roles, like a lot of pre-doc type positions. You're usually working with one professor at a lot of different uh, banks around the system. You're only assigned to one economist or to one group. And the whole breadth and variety of topics that you're able to see here is very helpful for those that are not super decided on what they want to do uh, before heading into grad school. I'll just add one more thing too. Uh, another RA made this point to me earlier, and I've been thinking about it all day actually. The size of the Cleveland Fed, because it's not an extremely large group, it's very easy to know everybody. And be, you know, if I'm thinking about a micro or time series question, I know exactly who to go to, and we already have a friendly relationship. It's very special in that way. I see economists in the hallway who maybe I don't work with them directly, but they know my face and they know my name, and that's something nice to come to every day. Question. How is your current position uh, contributing to your future goals? Sorry, could you, so how is my current position, what's my future goals? Sorry, I didn't quite catch. Yeah, so kind of what are you aiming for in the future and how does being an RRA contribute to it? Right. I mean, I'm just kind of think parroting what I said a little earlier, so maybe the other two can give more, but I, I want to get a PhD in economics. I want to apply this fall. And so being able to get research experience, maybe get a working paper out and getting good letters of rec, um, those are, I mean, if, if you look at some of the studies they do, it's like, what's one of the most important determinants of getting to a PhD program? And that's the letter of rec. And so, you know, while you're like as an undergrad, you know, you're working with a professor, but that professor has 30, 40 other students. You can only really go in during office hours. Here, I'm working with an economist for two years straight, essentially almost one on one. So it's a much deeper relationship that can usually, if you play your cards right, you know, stronger letters of recommendation, which will help the PhD, uh, PhD cycle. I think you made some great points about the PhD cycle, but even if someone isn't directly interested in, you know, I, I get that most people here are young and you may not know with certainty you want to do a PhD. I know I sure didn't. The RA position is still great. There's a lot of flexibility for what you want to do after being an RA. It's not like you're locked into just doing this route in academia. You have tons of options, whether it's in finance. We have an RA who just decided they're going to go to med school now. There's a lot of different paths you can take. And the skills you develop as an RA both hard and soft skills are very transferable. Yeah, generally, um, although the, the main distinctives of the program, or I shouldn't say main, but, but some of the main advantages of it are that it prepares you well for a PhD in a very, very competitive field. It's also very helpful. Part of my goals were to figure out whether I wanted to be doing that, and this is a great way to do it. I get to build relationships with people who have done that route and learn simple questions about how is things like work-life balance? How have you been able to prioritize other things that are important to you while advancing and being very successful in your field? Um, along with the fact that it's um, a very good like first job to have, um, I've thought about other sorts of data-related careers and all of the work that I'm doing there, the skills that I'm building are very helpful um, for any of those options as well. Um, so lots of opportunity to, to learn on the job, build your skills, and you don't have to know quite what's next for it to be helpful. Um, and I'd say that's definitely been the experience for me. Um, a little bit earlier, you mentioned programming. How necessary do you think having a solid grasp of Python, Java, or like C++ is to your job? Not. I mean, it's, it's helpful, right? It's never not going to be helpful. But it's a skill you develop. Um, 
computer like do you need to know like a theoretical computer science object oriented programming background you know no absolutely not um, should should you be able to like be able to learn on your own by googling in R Dipler how to do this yes absolutely but I mean you should have some very basic familiarity like what's a for loop what's an if else but other than that you can just learn as you go and I, I think the job is really conducive to you know, figuring out as you go, you don't need that formal background. Although it, it does help, um, it makes your that makes that learning curve easier. It's definitely not necessary at all. I think also, especially with the three of us, we all work in different programming languages. So I don't want someone to hear that. Oh, Chris uses R, Jason uses Stata, Matt Matt's talking about rat, using rats. Um, you don't need to be a master in all three of them. Personally, I advocate for getting one down pretty well and being like, I have the skills, I know how to work in this language and I could figure things out in this language. I think it's helpful. Yeah, and if you're, if you're thinking about wanting to be well qualified for like an internship or the research analyst position, having good real world experience with one statistical software, again, not as much pure computer science programming language like Matt mentioned, like one of R, Stata, or MATLAB, especially having experience working with real world messy data, um, if you know how to do that in one language, coming in, have some experience with it, you'll be able to hit the ground running and learn the other things that you need to um, as you go throughout the process. But I'd say definitely getting good experience with not just classroom, but real world applications in one uh, is a really good way to be prepared for the role. I'll also add, if you're trying to learn a particular language, just give yourself a basic goal. Tell yourself, I want to you know, run a basic regression on this data. I have to clean this data and organize it. It gives you motivation, and it's something tangible you could say you can accomplish using a programming language. Hi. I was just curious um, if there was anything that surprised you or maybe you wish you knew going into the RA position, or Matthew, you said you interned at the Fed. So, like, and then the question is, like, going from an intern to an RA, what was surprising? Just in general, when you started working at the Fed, was there something that surprised you, or maybe you wish you knew going into it? Um, everyone was super, super nice. Um, which, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people looking at me right now, so, like, I'm on the record for saying that. But, like, le not, not, like legitimately, they were extraordinarily um, very kind individuals who are just willing to, like, just chat with you. Like, there are people in the department, like, you know, I take the elevator to go back home at the end of the day. Like, never talked to them before. And they, we just start, start a conversation. We start talking about, like, interests. And it doesn't even have to be about that. Uh, there's a, one microeconomist here who's, like, a really big metal fan. And I'm, I also love metal. And so it's like, that was a cool thing that just didn't, they just came up because they were just really friendly. And it's a very supportive work group. I mean, I wasn't going to think I was going to come, I, I was thinking, I'm going to come to Cleveland. I'm going to find friends by, like, going to like a local board game cafe and like I'm not kidding when I say these eight guys that I joined with are you know my tour friend group here in Cleveland. They, it was an extraordinarily supportive and collegiate environment and that I was not expecting that. I thought this was going to be cutthroat. I thought this was going to be competitive. I thought I was going to be stressed out my entire time and thankfully it has not. I mean stressed out when pro deadlines approach but like you know not, not excessively so. Kind of going off that, I feel like the honesty too amongst the RA group, I kind of was nervous like, oh, what if I don't know something and everyone knows this and I'm the odd man out? It's not like that at all. Everyone's very honest with each other and there's a very, especially amongst the RAs, a strong sense of community and generally want to like help each other out. Um, but another thing that also surprised me was how involved RAs get to be in monetary policy work. So I don't know if that's of interest to you, but it really was to me. And again, I've said it earlier, but it's a genuine like privilege to be able to help with that. And it's my favorite part of the job, which is unique a little bit to the Cleveland Fed with how involved we are as RAs. I think uh, the only thing that I could add to uh, the, the very comprehensive list given there is how much you absorb just by walking around the hallways and hearing what people are working on and little terminology and things like that. Again, I was coming from less of an econ background. There were a lot of very simple terms that I'd never even heard thrown out before. And while there were a lot of things that I was learning directly about the fields that I'm doing research on or my other interests and things like that, the amount that I have picked up about other people's fields or other people's research and things like that 
without almost like by osmosis and just by proximity um, has been a really, really cool experience. And if I look back just any month to month, the amount of things that I know at the end of the month is always way more than I would have expected um, just by being here. I, I will add one thing that, that did surprise me, especially coming from the intern to, to the RA, um, was that, you know, I, I, or at least what I was afraid of when I was my undergrad, you know, as an undergrad deciding if I wanted to do a PhD program or an RA position is that a lot of other RA positions, like if you go to like a university, the pay is bad. Like, it's not good. And so my thought is like, well, if I'm going to get paid like a PhD student, I might as well be a PhD student working towards a degree. But here, like, the RA position is more than enough to be comfortable on. I live with my girlfriend, and my salary can support the two of us here in downtown Cleveland. Um, to be fair, downtown Cleveland is a low cost of living place. But if anything, that makes the salary go longer. So if I could tell my, my past self that, I would have definitely had immediately, instead of you know playing around like, well, do I really want to apply for a couple months? I would have just gone right for it if I had known that it was better than other RA positions that exist in the, in the nation. I just want to also remind our virtual audience, if you have a question, just uh, type it into the chat. I also wanted to ask you guys still if you could comment a little bit on how much uh, research experience you had before, as an undergraduate, say, before you applied. So I think I mentioned briefly, I had worked with a professor at my school, or two separate professors, um, as a part-time research assistant my junior and senior year. Um, and then I'd had two summer research experiences, one uh, my sophomore year, which would have been the, the summer of the pandemic. It was uh, um, just a remote sort of opportunity. That was the way that I sort of first got my foot in the door, started to program in R for the first time, started to learn how to data clean and things like that. And that turned into that opportunity for the rest of undergrad. Um, and then I'd done an internship in between my junior and senior year. Um, and then in addition, I did two separate independent research projects, one my junior year and then one my senior year as a senior thesis. Um, and I would say those were very helpful for giving me a sense of, do I actually enjoy this work? Um, going through the entirety of a project like many of you here have, have done today um, is a, a great way to figure out whether you want to continue down the route and also good preparation. It gives you a sense of how to talk about the things that you can answer well with this data, the things that you're limited in. Um, and as a, that's also something that I was asked about um, a lot in, in interview processes and things like that, where what are the projects you have done? Um, talk me through them, et cetera. Um, so that would be given that like internships, research opportunities take a little bit more to come by. Um, definitely projects on your own independent research is a great way to, to prepare yourself. Personally, I had very little research experience right up until my senior year. It wasn't until I attended an RA panel when I talked to RAs and I was like, how can I better equip myself to do this? And I was told, you need some research experience. So I followed their advice, you know, offer your professors free help. Someone will take it. Um, and that, that's how I got involved. I helped my professor do his research over the summer. And it was some great exposure and I learned a lot from it. So I think I'm kind of an outlier, um, at least to my co co current co cohort in terms of research experience. But I, I'm, I'm saying this, um, so like if you have a lot of research experience, so you don't feel like, oh, well, I don't need to come to the Cleveland Fed. Because I did, half a, or I did a semester with a nonprofit. I did my uh, senior thesis. I did interned for a year. And then I did another year of an undergraduate research grant. So. Most of this was shoved during my sophomore, junior, and senior year. So I had a decent amount of research experience. But So it makes us think, well, do you need this much research experience to be an RA? I would argue no, but even with all this research experience, it is, I've, I've been learning in my two years here. It hasn't been, oh, you know, the RA position is not very useful to me because I already have this research experience. Rather, it's taken what I've already accumulated during my undergrad and given it extra depth and extra dimension. Um, so if you're on the other end of the spectrum than Chris, like you didn't have a lot of research experience, but instead you have a lot of research experience and you're wondering, well, is this RA position worth it for me? You know, why don't I go directly into a PhD program? Um, I would argue that, you know, it's still extraordinarily useful. I'm learning all the time. I'm looking back at my undergrad research. I'm going to be honest, I want to smack myself sometimes with the things I did. So. 
And we have a question online uh, for the panelists. Thank you for the insights. What was the recruitment process of the RA position like? Did extracurricular and volunteering play a key role? Jason, you can probably comment on this the best, huh? I guess I can I can speak to this one a little bit since uh, the RAs, current RAs, actually get to be involved in the recruiting process for future cohorts. Um, so a lot of attention is given to research experience, to coding experience, some to coursework, some to your future plans. Um, I would say insofar as like extracurricular and volunteering, um, if that's a big part of your motivation and things that are very relevant to why you want to do research and why you think you would be a good fit for the role, that's absolutely something that will be considered. Um, and of course, there are other parts of the evaluation other than just the, the portion I was involved in. but. You're not going to be at a strong disadvantage if you have less of those things apart from your research experience, but it can be something that, that can contribute. Um, but I'd say coding, research experience are a lot of the big things, as well as you know, an interest in doing research, of course, but I don't think you'd be applying if you didn't have that. I, I would say um, if something's on your resume and you use that resume to apply, be prepared to ask about it because when I sent my resume in, I was working full time already and I thought, okay, all the questions are going to be about my job and what I'm doing now. There will be questions about like leadership experience that I had in college that I had to recall on the fly. Um, so make sure if you're putting extracurriculars down, you could think of tangible things that you did and skills you developed that you could bring to the Cleveland Fed. So talking in terms of the recruitment process, um, my experience through it was I still had to do the general apl application everyone else did, even though I was an intern. Um, I waited until applications opened in the fall. I sent in a resume. I probably sent in my transcript. I don't think it was a letter, but it may change. I, I don't quite remember. Um, and then they looked at it. I got a follow-up uh, email for an interview. Um, I interviewed, and then once that happened, you know, it just, from there, I got a call, did they want to hire me or not? So it's, it's, it's not a very tedious application cycle either. So if you're kind of worried, well, is it worth the cost of, and by the cost, I mean time cost, of applying um, if you might not even, because it's like, you know, if you have to go through four stages of interviews and like, you know, write up two essays, is it really worth your time to do it? I would argue, you know, here at the Cleveland Fed, at least when I had applied, re relatively lightweight, um, definitely was worth the time even if I had not gotten, you know, the job position. Question. Yeah, I have a question for Jason. So you have a lot of experience outside of economics. Have you been able to find any like advantages or disadvantages to that in terms of like your work and your future interests because of that broad background? That's a really interesting question. I think um, some of the particular math coursework, like I had taken a lot of math electives, I'd been exposed to um, like some Bayesian statistics, some machine learning models and things like that. Um, and so there are times that some of, the, some of the math in economics papers, especially as some of those topics start to spill over a little bit more, of course, Bayesian's common in, in, in econ as well. I've been able to catch up with those quicker than I have some other more conventional economic methods and things like that. Um, I don't know if that really gets at sort of what you're answering, but I'd say, like I think I said earlier about the, the difference of majors is that there's things that you're going to be more familiar with based on what you've studied, and there's things that you're going to be doing more learning on. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to it. Um, I wouldn't be able to really say which one's a, a better route or not, but it definitely means that I do think about things a little bit differently, but that's just different, not good or bad. Speaking for Jason, I would argue he offers like a super, like me being a very macro heavy person, you know, hearing Jason talk about papers and things he's done, he, he did in undergrad, it's like, wow, I did not even know that was a thing or, you know, stuff like that. So um, having him as a co-worker with an experience in the background that's, you know, kind of disparate or not quite the same as mine in terms of like, you know, he didn't have an econ background, it's enriching for me as, a, as, as his co-worker. I'll even add just by evidence of the people who I got to work with, I feel like the Cleveland Fed really values diversity of thought and welcomes people of all backgrounds. Like, as Matt just mentioned, it's very, very valuable to have people who think differently from you. I think that's something we really excel at here. 
if you go back in time and ask yourself a year ago, how would you define economics in simple terms? Would that answer be any different now? I'll give me a moment to think on that. <laughs> I think I'd be more likely to um, go on for longer and ask you, what do you mean by that question and why are you asking? Um, because there's a lot more to say than like the little definition that you get in undergrad. Um, I think, I guess, so one thing that I've definitely learned is how broad the field is and how many different things are touched on um, within the purview of economics. Um, that I, I don't know if I'd give the simple definition as much. Admittedly, there are reasons for that. Um, but I think I think I would want to know what's the goal of that question and what are you what are you what are you curious about? Because I can go on for a while about all of the things that are within the field. Yeah, I'm just curious how your I guess conception of the field has changed after your you know year of experience here. I feel like for me, uh, someone alluded to earlier how we get to visit these brown bags and see papers that are currently in development. It's really changed my perspective a lot on seeing just how broad economics is. I feel like even some of the papers today, we could see great examples of when you have an economic lens, you could really approach any problem in a really, really scientific way. I think it's very unique. You know, a year ago, I probably would have told you supp supply and demand, buy low, sell high, but um, it certainly changed a lot. I mean, if I look at it before I entered as an undergrad, I would have told you, oh, it's like, it's like a business degree, right, through the social, like the social behavioral science school. Um, if I had answered you as an undergrad, I probably would have said, you know, like, oh, you know, it's kind of this, you know, it's a study of scarcity. But for the caveat, that's like the same thing as saying real analysis is the study of the real number line. Like, true, but you're also losing a bunch of nuance. Um, to, uh, to answer now, you know, I, I would say econ, an uh, easy definition is that the, the issue is that there isn't really isn't one because we're kind of as a field trying to reconfigure ourselves as 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 the environment changes. You know, we have macroeconomists who are becoming increasingly theoretical, or macroeconomists who are inc becoming increasingly empirical and in, in terms of like applied models. In micro, we're also seeing like a shift towards more applied micro and like microeconomics. You know, empirical research. So, and I I just saw a really interesting blip paper a while ago. I think it was JES, which was um, it, it, it was it was essentially studying how um, reconstruction and like migration impacted like current like economic di like disparity, if you will. Which I would argue, like he asked me back in undergrad, that's not an econ topic, that's a sociology topic, and yet these were economists writing it. So I think I, I would argue that the field now is broadly anything that is like. Yeah, still the study of scarcity, but no, it's it's not just that anymore. It's it's gained this depth of application and this depth of just trying to analyze general social problems through this lens of scarcity, et cetera. And I'll just add a last quick thing. It's ever changing, right? That's the whole idea of being in research and being on the frontier of new ideas is your idea of what economics is now will probably change within the next five years. We have time for one last uh, quick question. Um. So um, I have been really enjoying macro classes, um, but I'm also taking politics class this semester and just realized how huge of a gap there is between macroeconomic research and real application and things. this is the field we work on. I'm just wondering if you guys feel the huge gap between um, just like theoretical academic research and like real world application. And I find it really frustrating. I'm just wondering how you guys feel about it. Should I start? So I, I think the advantage of us being here at the Fed is that you know we maybe we, we don't, but like generally speaking, our, our research is much more applied or like in terms of like policy than than other researchers would be. Like I, I agree. I, I remember that being an undergrad, you know, thinking like, wow, the research my professors are doing, cool, but like, what does this mean in terms of like helping people? And I think one of the benefits here at the Fed is that all the research we do, because we are you know this policy institution, has this this lens of what are the policy implications of it, um, which I think helps, um, and not just that, but we have to like do policy decisions, like we don't, but like generally the institution does, which means our research agendas tend to be tilted towards this more applied nature of, you know, real world, of solving real world problems than I feel like other academic institutions um, have. I feel like that's a very real frustration though, that you read some theoretical analysis, and although it's, it's important, especially to the person who developed it, you ask yourself, OK, but how does this better the world around me? And I definitely feel less of that frustration here at the Cleveland Fed. Part of our job is public service. 
and I think that's something that everyone here takes very seriously. So if that is something that concerns you, um, I would strongly advise you looking into the Federal Reserve System because that's what we're here for, right? And thank you. On that note, I want, we're, our time is up, unfortunately, but uh, I want to thank the panelists for a great discussion. I want to thank the audience as well for discussion. And then I hope that uh, just hearing about kind of more uh, what it's like to be an RA that it will inspire uh, many of you in the audience also to consider applying for this type uh, of RA positions or internship positions in the Cleveland Fed. So we, uh, we hire every year. So as, you, as I mentioned before, we have 15 positions in the department and, stu and RAs typically stay two or three years. So that means we're typically in, in a typical year we'll at least have five or even more openings uh, so please consider it when you're thinking about your future. <laughs>